vas-y. Hello everyone, uh, hello Jean. Uh, Hello, today, hello. hello. Today we are recording our last video of the six part uh, interview. Um, in the previous video, on the, yes, in the previous video, we talked about uh, the Broy bomb theory, and uh, the first video was about um, uh, fundamental issues uh, that uh, uh, that uh, quantum mechanics is um, um, how can I say um, confronted. I don't know if the, the word is uh, correct, but yeah, yes, uh, it's a correct. fundamental issue in quantum mechanics. And uh, we talked about the measurement problem and um, we you didn't really elaborate on this point, but uh, the measurement problem um, has uh, encouraged a lot of uh, like uh, for us uh, bad philosophy, uh, especially yes. Because of the the central uh, role role played by the, the observer observer, and mm. uh, so today we will talk about uh, uh, yes the um, quote unquote bad philosophy uh, that has been encouraged by uh, orthodox quantum mechanics. Yes. Okay. So thank you. I no will. Okay, so thank you. So let me first, let me summarize the three main ideas of the previous videos. The first one is that ordinary quantum mechanics predicts the result of laboratory measurements very effectively, but it says nothing clear about what happens outside of them, although obviously the world is run by quantum mechanics, but how it works, not clear. The combination of EPR and Bell's reasonings lead to the conclusion that the world is now local. So there are actions at a distance, and that's valid regardless of the truth of quantum theory as a whole. I mean, the reasoning is based on some experiment that were revealed by quantum mechanics, but it doesn't depend on the truth of the whole quantum formalism. And there is a way to supplement ordinary quantum mechanics with a theory about the world, which is the De Broglie-Bohm theory. This theory solves all the usual paradoxes of quantum mechanics. Now, in this video, we will first analyze quantum mechanics and philosophy of science in the 20th century, and then the relationship between quantum mechanics and our culture. That will be a brief. I claim that only quantum mechanics has been the bread and butter of what I call idealist philosophers. Now, idealism, of course, existed long before uh, quantum mechanics, and the critique of idealism here is not depending very much on quantum mechanics. I, I've been an outsider to philosophy, so I'm not claiming to be an expert, but I will say that there is a strong form of idealism, which is solipsism. And that's basically the idea that all that happens is what happens in my mind and the rest of the world, the outside world, just is a sort of theater play inside my mind. And the weak form is what I call Kant's idealism or versions of that, which is basically saying that, yes, there is an outside world, but we cannot know it except through our perception. So we can only know what we can perceive. Mm. And we can't go beyond our observation, our perception. So and the, the centrality... The, uh, the first one is ontologic. Uh, the worst uh, one is, yes, it's more, uh, well, it's Berkeley, yes. Berkeley, yes. Berkeley. Well, I mean, it's Berkeley, but I don't know if anybody is really seriously a solipsist because it's not even clear how to do it consistently, but it's the idea that there is only a movie going on in my mind, but there's nothing outside of it. So when I see you, for example, you are not there. I mean, you are just something happening in my mind. And Kant's idealism, I think I, this version of idealism tries to reconcile realism and uh, solipsism, but I think it doesn't really work and we'll see that. But you see the discourse on quantum mechanics lends an apparent support to the weak form. We do not have access to the world beyond our observation because everything is about observation done in the laboratory, etc. The De Bruyne-Bohm theory, which is a regular physics theory, shows that this centrality observ observation is not inevitable. Now, the argument, I think one of the best books I've seen of critique of idealism, I've seen many of them, 
It's a book by a philosopher, an Australian philosopher called David Stove, and the title of the book is uh, The Plato Cult and Other Philosophical Follies. And he, he identifies, and I think quite correctly, what he called the gem of idealism, the main statement, if you wish, which of course he, he criticized, but the reasoning is this. You cannot, trees, you cannot have trees without the mind in mind, without having them in mind. In other words, when you see trees, I think of course the trees exist outside of the mind. So I think of trees without the mind. But I cannot think of them without having them in mind, obviously. That's a tautology. And as he says, then you, you, <coughs> you start from a tautology and you derive an interesting conclusion that you cannot have trees without the mind in mind, which is of course false. I cannot, I can't think of trees without the mind. I can't tree, I see, when I see trees, I think of trees without the mind. And, you know, I, I have them in mind. And of course he makes it by con comparing with what he called gastronomical idealism. And he says, we cannot eat oysters. We can eat oysters only in so far as they are brought under the physiological and chemical conditions, which are the presupposition of the possibility of being eaten. Therefore, we cannot eat oysters as they are in themselves. I mean, you see, the falsity of the reasoning is this with the first reasoning, is that, of course, you need your perception, you need your mind, your concept, etc., in order to know things outside of us. But that does not mean that we cannot know things outside of us. I mean, I take it for granted that when I see you, it's because you are there. You're in different yeah. city. Uh, and uh, I mean, every I think it's, there is an I, I, ironical colleague of Stove who say we have eyes, therefore we cannot see. And I think that's a good summary because we need eyes to see, but that doesn't mean that we don't see. You see, we need, and the gastronomical idealism, there are certain conditions in order to eat oysters, but that doesn't mean that we cannot eat oysters as they are in themselves. So the, and, the, yes. the argument uh, could could be rephrased by saying that uh, we cannot know or think about uh, objective properties of the, the external world without having them in mind, the, the objective yes. properties. So we just, we, we can't think about it or we can't talk about, uh, we yes. just can't know that. These yes. subjective properties, I mean, okay. That's what it means. And he gives, I will quote a certain number of gems from famous philosophers and thinkers. And I think it's, I will explain why they are gems, but they are gems. It, it's really, he really nails it down to what they are. For example, of course, the founder of idealism, if you wish, of subject of uh, solipsism, Berkeley, although he wasn't solipsist in the way I've described it, yeah. he said the mind is deluded to think it can and does conceive of bodies existing unthought of. So I think of bodies exist, and you know, I can think of a tree that's there without yeah. me knowing about it, or without the mind, to at the same time they are preempted by or exist in itself. So we need the mind to know about bodies existing unthought of, and therefore it's an illusion to think that there are such bodies. Hume, which is not so bad in general, but here he says that the perception of the are the perception of the senses produced by external objects that resembles them. So if I see a tree, uh, you know, are the perception of the senses due to the tree in a sense? Yes. That's a question of fact. Where shall we look for an answer? To experience, surely, as we do in all other questions of that kind. But your experience is and must be entirely silent. The mind never has anything present to it except the perception and can't possibly experience their connection with objects. So this says that when I see a tree, I, of course, perceive a tree and I can't possibly experience the connection with objects. I, I do think that when I see a tree, I, uh, there is a connection with the, the tree. But uh, I mean, I can't prove it, maybe. That's possibly true, but uh, that doesn't mean that I don't uh, see a tree. I mean, Kant, of course, he has a, as usual with Kant, he has a complicated language, but if we treat our object as things in themselves, so I think the tree is in itself a tree, okay? It is quite impossible to understand how we could arrive at a knowledge of the reality outside of us, since we have to rely merely on the representation which is in us. This is a typical gem, okay? I cannot know that there is a tree outside there, because I have to rely on the representation. We cannot be sentient of what is outside ourselves, but only of what is in us, 
and the whole of our self-consciousness, therefore, he has nothing save merely our own determinations. It is a complicated way to say that we can sentient only uh, what is in us and not what is outside of us, though we cannot know something outside of us. And then he gives a very clear example, which I think is absurd, but it's a very clear example. We realize not only are the drops of rain mere appearances, but even their round shape, nay, even the space in which they fall, are nothing in themselves but merely modification of fundamental forms of our sensible intuition, and that the transcendental object remains unknown to us. The transcendental object being the drops of rain. Mm -hmm. But obviously, when I go outside <clears throat> and I uh, wonder whether I should take an umbrella or not, I'm worrying about whether there are drops of rain or not. And of course, the fact that he say, speak of their round shape I don't, uh, may not be completely round, but their shape, of course, is again some property of the drops of rain and not simply a production of my mind. And then, of course, some great mathematician who was influenced by philosophy, idealistic philosophers, or maybe he was just joking, uh, point carré in the value of science, wrote, all that is not thought is pure nothingness. Since we can't think, again, it's a gem, we can think only thought, and all the words we use to speak of things can express only thought. To say that there is something other than thought is therefore an affirmation which can have no meaning. So he thinks that there is only thought, and the thought of whom? Of him? Of mankind? Of God? I mean, it's totally unclear what he really means if he thinks that this statement has a meaning. And then, of course, there is also another position which is not so philosophical, which is more methodological, which is there is what well, is called instrumentalism or, posi or sometimes positivism, but that's a complicated word because there are many versions of what you mean by positivism. But the idea is that since you have no access of the true nature of things, we should content ourselves with saving the phenomenon or saving the appearances or effectively predicting our subjective experience without seeking to understand where they come from. You don't want to be, you know, believe that you have an explanation or a deep understanding of the knowledge of things. You just want to save the phenomena. Mm -hmm. And that attitude is extremely widespread among physicists, uh, those who uh, announce, renounce the idea of understanding the world because of quantum mechanics. Mm. Yes, the, the link is very clear between this idea and the 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 the, the quotes uh, you you put uh, in your slide for the the first video, um, yes. saying that uh, with quantum mechanics uh, there there has been um, like a, I don't know if the word is correct, but a switch. Uh, yes. Understanding rea uh, reality or the nature to uh, un uh, talking about what we can say about nature. Yes, yes, we can only like Bohr and we the... can't yeah, we can't cannot speak of nature, but only of our knowledge of nature. Yes. Which is similar to this. It's a vague idea, but it's a spirit that we can only and this has been very nicely criticized by a philosopher of mine named F Jerry Fodor, mm -hmm. which I will quote now. He says if all you want is to be able to predict your experiences, the rational strategy is clear. Don't revise your theories, just arrange to have fewer experiences. Close your eyes, put your fingers in your ears, and don't move. Now, why didn't Newton think of that? Of course, he's ironical here. Sure, it is tough about the business of science being to save the appearances. Guess the priorities backward, and the tail has commenced to wag the dog. I mean, the you know, saying the tail wags the dog is, of course, the it's the dog that wags the tail. Mm. Uh, but and then he makes the point: what goes on in science is not that we try to have theories that accommodate our experiences; is closer that we try to have experiences that, that educate among our theories. And that you can see the, throughout the history of science, people try to have experiences more and more detailed. For example, we make very precise uh, check on quantum mechanics, on general relativity, etc. If we didn't want, if we wanted to save the phenomena, general relativity is perfect. We nevertheless test it to see if there is no deviation that could be due to quantum mechanics or something like that. And that's exactly the way it works in science. People do more and more detailed experiments in order to educate between different theories. And they don't just come up. You see, because the view, the view here is like the experience is given to us, and then we try to find a theory that accounts mm. for the phenomena. 
But that's not at all the way it works. People build laboratories, build uh, uh, reactors and so on in order to check the theories. Mm. But they wouldn't have to do that if the whole point was to save the phenomena because then they would just need fewer phenomena. And I think that's exactly getting the whole idea completely wrong. And again, in the De Bruyne-Bohm theory, there is no retreat to saving the phenomena. It's just a physical theory like any other. Of course, we don't know if it's true. It may, we're not sure that it's true, but it has empirical evidence for it, which is the, all the ones of quantum mechanics. And it's not like quantum mechanics because it completes quantum mechanics. It gives a theory of what goes on in the world outside the laboratories. Now, of course, the last point is there is a whole second-hand literature thinking that it draws the lesson of quantum theory. And that you see all over the place in popular literature, in uh, you know even scientific journals, etc. And of course, also in what is called postmodernism. I have no time to describe that in detail. But of course, the emphasis is put on several things. One is, of course, indeterminism. People like the idea that uh, you know quantum mechanics shows indeterminism. This is usually confused with unpredictability. People don't really understand what determinism means. And they think that because uh, the result can be random or look random, then there must be indeterministic, which is not true because you can take a coin tr throwing or toss, uh, coin tossing, sorry. And, and that's a phenomenon which is deterministic, but nevertheless, in, in, unless you, you are very careful, it's unpredictable. And it's the same thing with the bright boom theory you can very well have a deterministic theory behind an apparently indeterministic uh, reality. Then there is a constant misunderstanding of Einstein and Bell and the idea that Bohr won, which is then uh, taken as an argument against, against, I don't know, against the existence of the real world or something like that. And then there is a lot of confusion about free will because there's the idea that if the world is indeterministic, then free will is possible. But the problem is that free will, the way it's understood, is not simply that the world is in, the, there are some random events in our mind, our brain, that produce such and such effect. I mean, free will is really the idea that there is an I who, who makes choices, who makes conscious choices, in fact, in a deterministic universe, otherwise they wouldn't be able to make choices. And this idea of free will is outside of physics, I would say. I mean, physics, whether physics is deterministic or indeterministic, doesn't really account for uh, free will the way people speak about it. So th there's a lot of confusion. And of course, there is also a huge uh, uh, emphasis put on the reality, the disappearance of reality or of matter. I mentioned Mermin in the first video, who said that the moon is demonstrably not there when nobody looks. Well, of course, obviously, <laughs> the moon is, I believe that the moon is there when nobody looks. But uh, that's, that's sort of the fact that people can go to such absurdity and say, and is very competent physicist can say these things as a consequence of quantum mechanics. You see, this is of course always justified by the fact that quantum mechanics de deals with laboratory measurement, therefore with observation, etc., etc. And then of course there is a whole blah blah old talk, loose talk about the wave function reduction involving our mind and therefore there is a mind separate from the body and the mind intervene in the in the in the physical world etc and uh, of course we don't know exactly what to say about that i mean it's nothing clear being said but all these speculations are eliminated by the the Braille bohm theory so i think that the Braille bohm theory is very useful in showing that all this philosophy which go, which is of course much anti, uh, press, which existed long before quantum mechanics, mm. uh, doesn't have to be followed. Whether it's idealism or instrumentalism, I mean, people use quantum mechanics as argument for those philosophy philosophies. You can of course adhere to them if you want. I don't think you should, but you could. But certainly, the De Bruyne theory shows that it's not necessary. Mm. Finally, the worst lesson of all, in, in my view, is the one, of course, I was br uh, brought up with, is which is pragmatist, but I think it's irrationalist, and many physicists say, shut up and calculate. Namely, when people ask questions about the meaning of quantum mechanics in physics lectures, people say, okay, we can't answer those questions, so shut up and calculate. They don't necessarily say it so brutally, but that's basically what they say, and you can calculate. 
And that's a total change of attitude with the shift around the Second World War from the center of the center of physics from Central Europe to the United States. In Central Europe, when you had, of course, Einstein, Bohr, Heisenberg, everybody, uh, you know, Pauli, I mean, all, all the great physicists of the Solvay Congress were Europeans. And they had a very strong philosophical culture, which was often idealistic, but not, not, not Einstein. But then, of course, in the US, after, and especially after the war, with the Cold War, etc., uh, people were put rid of not asking questions, and you need research funding, and and that I think has been catastrophic, because uh, the even though I don't like, for example, Bohr and Heisenberg, etc., at least they were admitting that one could discuss certain questions. But after the war in the United States, it became less and less uh, possible to ask questions. Although I must say, Bohr himself was, of course, a uh, Bohm himself was American, and also Everett with another uh, theory about quantum mechanics was also American, and they were both in Princeton. But then the problem is that there is a huge misunderstanding of EPR and Bell. People don't understand the non-locality, although that's changing slightly. And then, of course, the presentation of quantum mechanics, either in the lectures or the popular literature, is... Uh, uh, confused, let's say, in the popular literature, and it's ununderstandable in physics lecture, and I found that very uh, damage, uh, very uh, bad, I mean, in the sense that people, I think phys honest students cannot understand what is being told in their courses, and that, I think, is, is a serious problem, or else they are driven towards idealistic or instrumentalist philosophies. Mm. So that's it for my summary of what my complaint about the philosophy of quantum mechanics. Yes, uh, it was very clear. Thank you. Thank you. And okay. uh, thank you for this uh, series of interview. Okay, you're welcome. Thank you for having me. Okay, so. Bye.